Throughout the centuries, there were many kings and queens that ruled over England, and some are regarded as good, but some are regarded as absolutely terrible. Amongst the great were rulers such as Elizabeth I, who defiantly saw off the threat of the Spanish Armada, and Henry V, whose victory at Agincourt established him as a fearsome European warlord. But there were also some who were regarded as shocking, including Bloody Mary I, who burned hundreds of people at the stake for their religious beliefs, and her father Henry VIII even executed two of his own wives and some of his closest friends. In this video, we're looking at some of the deaths of the kings and queens of England. Please bear in mind this is not an exhaustive list, and also we'll be compiling more parts of this shortly. Join us today as we look at the painful deaths of the kings and queens of England part 1, and as always to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. He also was involved in the conversion of a Viking leader, and he helped to spread Christianity within his kingdom of Wessex. But more than being a skilled military leader, he was a learned and calm man, who demonstrated great leadership throughout his time on the throne of Wessex. As time went on, his reputation for being a scholar, and a man who promoted education and writing histories, developed and he gained the nickname The Great in the 1500s. At the time of his ruling, England was divided into different kingdoms and lands, and it was a very turbulent time in which he was ruling, with invasion and hostility a constant threat. Alfred wished for peace a significant amount of time, and he changed things in England forever. But what happened in his demise and death? Alfred was born around the year 849, and was the son of Ethelwulf, the King of Wessex, and his wife Osber. His biographer Asser wrote that, in the years of our Lord's incarnation, 849, Alfred, king of the Anglo-Saxons, was born in Wantage, which at the time was a royal estate. He was the youngest of six children, and his elder brother Athelstan was later appointed the sub-king of Kent, and he died in the 850s. His next three brothers were kings of Wessex, and his sister was married to Burgred, the king of Mercia, in 853. Alfred's mother was described as a most religious woman, noble by temperament and noble by birth, and she passed these religious qualities on to her son. In 868, Alfred married Elswith, who was the daughter of a Mercian nobleman, who was the elder man of the Gainey. This group were a tribal group of Mercia, and together the couple had five or six children. Alfred's successor was his son, Edward the Elder, and Athelflaed, his daughter, became the Lady of the Mercians, and another daughter, Elfrith, married Baldwin II, the Count of Flanders. In 868, Alfred was recorded as fighting alongside Athelred, in an attempt to keep the Viking army, the Great Heathen Army, which was commanded by Ivor the Boneless, out of the Kingdom of Mercia. There were a number of engagements fought between the Saxons and Vikings at the time, and the Saxons were victorious in a number of battles, but were defeated in a few as well. In April 871, Athelred died, and Alfred came onto the throne of Wessex, despite Athelred leaving two sons, who were considered too young to rule. Whilst Alfred was attending to his brother's funeral, the Danes attacked the Saxons whilst he was away, and later defeated them at Wilton. The Viking army did later withdraw, and it's assumed that Alfred paid the Vikings to leave, and hordes have been found which show large sums of Viking silver and gold, paid by Alfred. Alfred titled himself the King of the West Saxons, and later labelled himself the King of the Anglo-Saxons, as more of England came under his rule and control but he was not the first to claim he was the King of the English. One of his greatest victories came in the Battle of Eddington in 878. He pushed the Danes back to their stronghold at Chippenham, and then starved them to the point where they had to negotiate and do a deal with the Saxons. One of the terms of the surrender was that the Danish King Guthrum was to convert to Christianity, and this happened three weeks later, and a number of Guthrum's closest leaders were also baptised. Also Alfred, created what was known as a Dane law in the north of England during these negotiations, and it was said that peace hopefully would have been kept between those living under the Dane law and the Kingdom of Wessex. Alfred later travelled to Rome, and whilst here he learned how other kings across in Europe had dealt with Viking raiders, and whilst here he came up with a form of taxation for his kingdom. He changed the tax laws in Wessex to make sure that defences could be paid for and maintained, and a system of fortifications called Burrs were created to help deal with Viking raids. The raids did resume in 892, 
and Alfred was in a much stronger position to defend against them now, as he had a mobile field army, a significant number of garrisons and professional soldiers, and he also had a small fleet of ships, which would be used on the rivers and estuaries inside of his land. The Danes came across to Wessex initially in 330 ships, and they based themselves in Kent, and they brought their wives and children with them, showing that they intended on settling and colonising England. Alfred negotiated with Haston, a commander of the part of the army, and the Danes were eventually defeated. The Vikings did attempt to break through the English lines, but were later plagued by a lack of food and supplies, and a few years later they withdrew completely. Despite being a successful military leader and commander, Alfred's legacy was also in that he was seen as a reformer and an advocate of education. Alfred was involved in translating works from Latin to English to make sure that his population had a wealth of books that they could learn from. He was inspired in this by Charlemagne and he created court schools which allowed the nobility to have good access to a good standard of education. Also those who were not in the nobility were allowed to attend and inside of these schools the best scholars across Wessex would teach. His influence was to try and help develop Anglo-Saxon culture and society to make the people more learned. Alfred was known for being a man of education and being level-headed and he wished for his people to learn in Old English rather than Latin. Danish raids had previously caused chaos with education and learning in the country, but Alfred sought to try and make this better. Shortly before his death, he ordered the creation of the new Minster in Winchester, which he hoped would become a mausoleum for he and his family once they had passed away. In terms of his reputation across the kingdom, it was said he was greatly loved more than all of his brothers, with a universal and profound love, and he was always brought up in royal court. He was seen as more comely in his appearance than his brothers, and more pleasing in manner, speeches and behaviour. In spite of all the demands of the present life, it has been the desire for wisdom more than anything else together, with the nobility of his birth, which characterised the nature of his noble mind. But on the 26th of October, 899, at around the age of 50 or 51, Alfred the Great passed away. For much of his life he had suffered greatly with pain and illness relating to his stomach and digestive system. His biographer Assa, who wrote down and described a large amount of Alfred's life, documented a description of Alfred's symptoms. The pain Alfred had was harsh and relentless and it persisted for over 20 years and the cause remained unknown to the physicians at the time. This led to many people speculating that the king was possessed by a devil or had been punished by a witch, or a Danish seer. Many of us thought that he may have suffered with an unknown fever or possibly hemorrhoids, but using what we know now about illnesses in the human body, it's interesting to consider that Alfred the Great suffered from Crohn's disease. This causes painful and chronic inflammation of the digestive system, and can cause ulcers to form. Doctors still don't know what exactly causes it, and common symptoms of it are abdominal pain, cramping, fever, tiredness and passing blood in stores, of which Alfred was known to have suffered with. Alfred, it's alleged, did manage to work out which foods made his pain worse, such as meat, and may have even eaten a mostly vegetarian diet because of this. Further evidence points towards the king having Crohn's, as it's considered that his grandson King Edred also suffered with similar symptoms and problems. With this he would have been suffering from the pain throughout most of his life, and there would have been little relief for Alfred the Great. His pain must have been difficult to deal with, along with being the King of Wessex, and it was said he tended to have periods where it did not bother him too much. He went from times where the pain was not present, to times where it was so severe that he was unable to leave his room. If Alfred suffered with tuberculosis or colon cancer, then he would not have lived as long as he did, so it's considered that the King died from Crohn's. Alfred was buried for a short period at the Old Minster in Winchester, with his wife and later son, Edward the Elder. Four years after his death, his body and family's bodies were exhumed and were laid to rest in the new Minster. They were there for 211 years until William the Conqueror demolished the new Minster Abbey where Alfred was laid to rest. Monks did exhume the bodies of him and his family and he was reinterred at Hyde Abbey. They were buried before the high altar but during the reign of Tudor King Henry VIII many of the Roman Catholic churches and sites were vandalised by the English during the dissolutions of the monasteries. Hyde Abbey was dissolved in 1538, and the graves housing Alfred and his family remained underground, before the construction of a town jail was created on the site. <laughs>
before the construction began, convicts who were later imprisoned there were sent to prepare the ground, and they discovered the coffins of Alfred and his family. The local priest wrote, This miscreant's couch amidst the ashes of our Alfred and Edwards, and where once religious silence and contemplation were, only interrupted by the bell of regular observance, the chanting of devotion, now alone resound the clank of the captive's chains and the oaths of the profligate. In digging for the foundation of the mournful edifice, at almost every stroke of the mattock or spade, some ancient sepulchre was violated, the venerable contents of which were treated with marked indignity. On this occasion, a great number of stone coffins were dug up, with a variety of other curious articles, such as chalices, rings, buckles, the leather of shoes and boots, velvet and gold lace, belonging to chaucibles and other vestments, as also the crook, rims and joints of a beautiful crow's double gilt. Today the remains of Alfred the Great remain lost, and it's not known what happened to them. He was a king who changed England and Wessex for good, and he helped to defeat the Danes a number of times. He was a clever man and an intelligent one, but a king who devoted much of his time to God and religion. He did suffer throughout his life, with painful stomach conditions, that caused him to waste away, and they later killed him. He is most famous for the signing of the Magna Carta, a decree that limited the power of the king, ensured feudal rights, and also stated that no man, including the king, was above the law. His reign was considered to have been chaotic and disastrous, however in 1216 inside of Newark Castle, inside of the gatehouse, John died from a particularly nasty bout of dysentery. But there were rumours that emerged after his death that in fact John had been killed, in rather brutal fashion. John was born around Christmas in 1166 in Oxford, and he was the youngest and favourite son of King Henry II. When his father passed away in 1189, his brother Richard became the King of England and King Richard I. John was given gifts of land, titles and money, following his father's death. However, Richard in 1190 regarded his nephew Arthur as the heir to the throne. Richard I was imprisoned in Germany in 1193, and during this John tried to take control of the throne of England, but he failed to do so, and when Richard returned the following year, John was banished from the country. The two brothers did make up, and when Arthur was captured and taken prisoner, John was made the heir to Richard's throne. In 1199, Richard passed away, and then John became the king. War with France continued and began again, which was triggered by John's second marriage to Isabella, the Countess of Ugelmer. She had already been engaged to a prominent French noble, and the marriage threatened the interests of the French royal family. John treated these with contempt, and this resulted in an uprising that was crushed initially by John, but war did break out. By 1206, John had lost Normandy, Anjou, and other important parts of France, and these failures led to many to question his suitability to rule in England. It damaged his reputation massively, and John was determined to win these back, but in order to do so, he needed a large amount of money to continue to go to war with France. For this, he began to impose rather harsh taxes, and his government were ruthless in obtaining them, which caused a rather big problem with his popularity. People in England did not like paying extra tax, and many of them could not afford to do so. But in England, the barons who presided over large amounts of land were incredibly unhappy with John and his new taxes. John exploited his power and rights to take as much as he wanted, and the barons were furious. Eventually they went to war with the monarchy, and when the rebel barons took many different strategic castles and sites, the barons even invited the French king to England to help them take the fight to John, and lead them, and it was said that the French king did have a claim to the throne. In 1215, John was forced to negotiate with the rebels when they seized London, and on the 19th of June, 1215, he accepted the terms put forward by the barons, and was forced to sign Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, that limited his powers, and ensured that the king was not above the law. It was the first formal document stating that the monarch was under the rule of the country as much as his people were, and that the rights of individuals were to be upheld, even if the king did not like this. This settlement was deemed impractical, as John claimed 
They were signed under duress, and the Pope took his side, and King John then laid waste and rampaged through the northern counties and the Scottish border region. When Louis of France did invade, John continued to fight the barons, but in October 1216, everything changed for the much reviled and hated King of England. In October 1216, John was travelling across England with a number of his followers, and he stopped to rest at an abbey of Swineshead in the Lincolnshire Fens. In the treacherous Fens, he had lost half his baggage, and when he arrived at the residence of the abbey, quickly scrambled to find food and accommodation fit for the king. It's believed that John may have even lost the English crown jewels in his travels at the time, and it's suggested that some of these even fell into the wash when he crossed the water. Some rumours have emerged about what occurred inside of the abbey. One is that inside of the house, John was poisoned by the monks, who found the king to be very arrogant. It was believed that the abbot did not want to host John, and that the king's reputation for cruelty and spite and even murder did not sit well with the monastic order. John ate their food and drank with the monks, and one allegation is that John was poisoned by the monks, with poison that had been extracted from toads, and this was considered deadly. But at some point the king did leave the abbey, and it's not entirely confirmed what emerged from the visit, and he continued on to Newark Castle a short while away. It's believed that John met his end near or very close to a toilet inside of Newark Castle in October 1216. It's mostly believed that King John died from dysentery, a disease and illness that causes serious diarrhoea and eventually death. It was believed that John had been ill for quite some time before he came to settle in Newark. The rumours state that he could have been poisoned, or that he was brought down by eating unripe peaches which poisoned him and made him very sick, or also that he could have drank too much sweet ale which also made him ill. It was said to say John died of overindulgence was a way of criticising his personality. It implies intemperance, gluttony and imprudence. To say he was poisoned shows he was hated. Whatever the truth, those writing down history had nothing good to say about John. Dysentery is caused by parasites in the gut and is most commonly spread by consuming dirty water or food that has been contaminated with human waste. It was not necessarily a condition of the common people who lived in unsanitary conditions as lots of food and vegetables had been grown in soil which was fertilised by human waste. It's likely that the king, who had been marching across the country and was most probably physically exhausted and emotionally exhausted, succumbed to his fate from dysentery. It was a condition that could affect anyone. For example, Edward I died from it as he went to renew his war with Robert the Bruce in 1307, and it could have also caused the death of Edward the Black Prince. Dysentery also killed the hero of Agincourt, Henry V, whilst he was fighting away in France. John was regarded as a cruel king, who punished his people and made their lives rather miserable, but today dysentery still kills many around the world, as sewer systems and water systems are not very advanced. He died on the 19th of October, 1216. It's likely that it was inside the gatehouse of Newark Castle, or in a room that was fitted with a functioning toilet following having a feast at the castle. Following John's death, his body was taken south by a group of mercenaries where he was buried inside of Worcester Cathedral. There is some debate as to what caused his death. Was it drinking dirty water or eating vegetables contaminated with human waste or was it due to overeating? There is a tradition that John died from eating too many peaches or that he was in fact poisoned by monks or other people who wished to end his notorious reign. John has been described as being distasteful and even dangerous and spiteful and cruel. From this, John remains a very controversial figure in history, with most people considering that he was in fact the very worst king that England ever had. The fact he went to war with the barons and was forced to sign a charter that limited his power and ensured he was not above the people with regards to the law signifies what a truly terrible king he really was. Edward II was a son of Edward I and Eleanor of Castile. His father is considered today a successful but brutal military leader who is linked to expanding castles and winning many battles. Edward II himself was born inside the walls of Carnarvon Castle as the decision for this to occur 
was a conscious one, with the fact Edward I wanted to bring together Wales and England, as he had conquered large parts of it. Edward II became king, following his father's death, on the 7th of July 1307. One of his first commands was to recall Pierce Gaveston to his court, a man who it's been rumoured to have been his lover. The next year, Edward II married the 12-year-old Isabella of France, despite the large age gap, with Edward being 23. Their marriage was an attempt to relieve tension between England and France, and they had four children, but Edward often left the Queen feeling neglected while spending time with his favourites. Pierce Gaveston in particular was showered with gifts and titles, and he began to insult many of England's barons, calling the Earl of Warwick the Black Hound of Arden. However, the Hound would eventually come back to bite him. Edward and Piers' relationship was described as a sin against nature and a love beyond the love of women, and it's thought that the king loved him. Gaveston later was captured after he fled for his safety, and he was located at Scarborough Castle. A number of barons captured him, and they tried to force the king to agree to the barons' demands, and Gaveston was held at Warwick Castle, and was then sentenced to death. In nearby woodland, he was then beheaded by a sword. Edward was seen as weak, and this was noticed by Robert the Bruce, the Scottish military leader. He had lost large amounts of his kingdom during Edward I's reign, and wished to take it back. In 1314, Edward II and his army marched north to stop the Scots, but Robert had recaptured most of the castles taken by Edward previously, and had encroached into northern England. On the 23rd of June 1314, the Battle of Bannockburn erupted, and it resulted in a devastating loss for the English king. They were routed and chased by the Scots, with Edward II himself forced to run back. Despite his former friendship with Pierce Gaveston, Edward also grew closer with another favourite, Hugh de Spencer, who was given a large amount of land. This angered the nobles, and at times tensions between the French and English had also deteriorated. Isabella, Edward's wife, was sent to pay homage to her brother, the French king, but instead she plotted against her now-hated English husband. She, along with her lover, Roger Mortimer, the Earl of March, invaded England, and they wished to oust the king. Isabella even managed to capture and besiege a number of cities. However, Edward was captured, and he was forced to give up the throne. This left his 14-year-old son, Edward III, the King of England. During this revolt, Dispenser was executed, being hanged, drawn and quartered, and he had Bible verses etched into his skin. His father was also executed, and was then fed to some dogs. Edward II was then imprisoned inside Kenilworth Castle, and was then moved to Berkeley Castle for his safety in early 1327. It was here that Edward was murdered, and he never left his cell once he was there. He was kept here as it was believed to have been more secure, but we don't really know how he was looked after. Castle records state that he was brought a number of luxury goods, but contemporary accounts claim he was treated poorly and was kept in terrible conditions. It was suggested that he was kept in a damp and dark dungeon, and was left to stew in horrific conditions inside a dirty cell, with rotting animal carcasses sharing it too. It was hoped he would catch disease and die from these dead animals, rather than for him to be murdered in cold blood, with his prison guards being then held accountable for the death of a king. One thing is certain though, and it's that Edward II was killed or died inside of the castle. On the 23rd of September 1327, Edward III was told of his father's death a few days before in the evening of the 21st. Most historians accept that he did die on this date, but some believe it was later, but the circumstances of his death are slightly unclear. The most accepted and common story is that Edward II was murdered in cold blood on the orders of his wife Isabella and her lover Roger Mortimer. It is believed that an assassin crept into his cell in the middle of the night and then murdered him, shoving a red hot burning poker up his backside that slashed his entrails and caused catastrophic internal bleeding. It was said that the guards in the castle 
heard piercing screams coming from the king's chamber that evening, and that these screams were so loud that they were heard miles away. This rumour began in the 1330s, but there is no evidence to suggest it's true, and it could have just been propaganda. Another source claimed that Edward died at the castle, with no explanation as to how he died, and others claimed that he succumbed to natural causes. It's also debated whether he contracted an illness, but some accounts even claim he died of melancholy and sorrow inside of his cell. One bizarre account claims that he was murdered by a trick, or killed with suffocation and strangulation, or by violent means. Another even says how he was allegedly even freed from captivity, and that he managed to travel to Germany with his son the king, later meeting up with him in secret. The truth behind Edward II's death is that no one could be 100% sure what actually happened to him, but it's mostly accepted that he was murdered inside of the castle. In what manner he was killed remains a mystery today, and it's up to you whether you believe the Red Hot Poker story or not. Maybe you actually think he escaped and fled to Europe. However, one day it's very possible that this medieval murder mystery will be put to bed with a solution. The murder of King Edward II still remains a shocking event in English history. Henry VI was the last Lancastrian to rule England. He was king twice from 1422 to 1461, and then for a year in 1470, before being kept off the throne for good. He was born on the 6th of December 1421 at Windsor Castle. His father was a valiant and brilliant King Henry V, the man who defeated the French spectacularly at Agincourt during the 100 Years' War. Henry VI was the youngest person, and still is, to ever come onto the throne and to succeed, but was officially crowned in 1429. He was even named the King of France in 1431, after his father's victories and successes in the 100 Years' War, but as was normal, he would not rule solely until he was old enough, and in the meantime a Regency Council oversaw the two nations. He married Margaret of Anjou in 1445, and was noted to have been a very religious man, but a king who put his faith in the wrong people and advisers. Power struggles often occurred at his court, and he found it incredibly difficult to oversee England, let alone rule over France too, and this stressful situation caused great strain on Henry. Things got worse with Joan of Arc's success, and reputation causing significant damage to the English in France, and in 1450 Normandy was lost, which led to many in England to question their own king. Because of successive failings in France, the king was driven to a nervous breakdown, which occurred in 1453, and during this time, Richard the Duke of York was named the protector of England. It took the king two years to recover, but during this time, there had been a great divide emerge in the country. Civil war broke out in England, dividing the nation between the Lancastrian and Yorkist factions. This saw the protector, the Duke of York, fighting against the king, and in particular Henry's queen, who commanded the Lancastrian efforts. In 1460, the Duke of York was slain in the Battle of Wakefield, but then his son took up arms in the fight for the crown, and he heavily defeated Henry VI's forces at the Battle of Toton, which was described as the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil. Edward then claimed the throne after the battle, and crowned himself King Edward IV. Henry VI fled and went into exile, but later returned a year later, and was captured by Edward. During his capture he was then later paraded throughout London, with his feet tied to a horse, and he wore a straw hat proclaiming him to be a rebel. This caused great humiliation for the man who ruled over England for decades. But Henry would be returned to the throne, as at the turn of the 1470s, an incredibly powerful medieval noble would switch his alliance from York to Lancaster. The Earl of Warwick, known as the Kingmaker, switched, turning on the new king, Edward IV. He was seen as the most powerful man in England, and the true power behind the Wars of the Roses. He then managed to restore Henry VI onto the throne in 1470, and Edward himself was forced into exile. He later returned a year later, and laid waste to the Lancastrians, the Battle of Tewkesbury in May 1471. This battle in particular was noted for heavy losses of Henry VI's forces, and his only son was also killed. 
Edward the Prince of Wales, was at one point the successor, but he was killed at the age of 17 on the battlefield. Edward IV, who then retook the crown, threw Henry into prison, sensing how dangerous it was having him around. He was thrown into not just a normal prison, he was imprisoned at the Tower of London, a place that today is synonymous with torture, execution and brutality. The Tower, after all, is a place where three queens lost their heads, but what is less known is that it was a place where at least one king also died. It was said that when the royal party, presumably Edward IV, arrived in London, they were informed that Henry VI was dead. Official chronicles and documents from the time state how the deposed king passed away in the evening of the 21st of May, 1471. It's considered that Henry's enemies kept him alive for a while, as they feared his son more as a ruler, and they was favoured having the weaker Henry, as it was favoured having the weaker Henry as the head of the Lancastrian forces, as he was doing more damage to his country, and his son would have been a better king. According to the history of the arrival of Edward IV, an official chronicle biased towards Edward, it was said that Henry VI died of pure displeasure and melancholy upon hearing the news of the Battle of Tewkesbury and his son's death. However, this can't be really believed, as sources close to Edward would not specifically say that Edward ordered the king's death or had Henry VI killed, as at the time kings were believed to have been sent by God to rule. If Edward had in fact ordered Henry's death, then he could have been seen to have offended God and to be nothing more than a murderous usurper. But the believed story of Henry VI's death and passing is much more brutal and savage than that. There have been a few people who have been blamed for the death of Henry VI, and one of them is the notorious King Richard III. Richard, who was the Duke of Gloucester at the time, has been blamed for the death of Henry. Sir Thomas More, the Tudor advisor to Henry VIII, stated Richard killed Henry, but it's believed that this was done as a way to portray Richard, the enemy of the Tudor dynasty, as a murderous and barbaric individual. It's believed there that Richard was away from London at the time of Henry's death, and also that it was just 18 when he died. It's believed that Henry was murdered, and although in some accounts a specific murder is not named, it was said that Edward IV must have given the order for the death of his prized prisoner inside of the Tower of London. Having Henry VI alive ultimately was dangerous for Edward, and by ordering the death of him, he was extinguishing and exterminating the direct line of the House of Lancaster with ruthlessness. The belief about Henry VI's death is that on the night of the 21st of May 1471, on the night of the Vigil of the Ascension, Henry was praying inside his chapel in his prison. He was being held inside of the Wakefield Tower, one of the oldest parts of the Tower of London, which was built in the 13th century. Whilst on his knees praying, someone came up behind him and stabbed the former king to death using a dagger or a sword. So whilst Henry VI was most vulnerable, an opportunistic assassin went up behind him, murdered him in cold blood and ended the life of a man who had reigned over the country. Henry's body was originally buried inside of Chertsey Abbey, but his body was later moved to St George's Chapel inside Windsor Castle by Richard III. Allegedly, Henry's body was exhumed in 1910, and when the bones were analysed it was said he was a 5 feet 9 inches tall. His light hair was also said to have been covered in blood, which is interesting as for over 400 years it remained preserved, and his skull had a significant amount of damage. This put beyond doubt rumours that the king simply died from melancholy and in fact met a very bloody end. Henry VI's murder and death is considered a forgotten moment in English history, but he was a king born onto the throne. His reign is seen as a poisoned chalice, as Henry being the king of France and England could do nothing to juggle the thrones. He was plagued by poor judgement and by a civil war that split England and caused immense brutality and changed the face of history forever. His murderer has been lost to time, but what is certain is the fact he had a very violent death inside one of history's most famous prisons. Edward IV came onto the throne first in 1461, but in 1470 he was briefly deposed by Henry VI, the very man he kicked off the throne, and then he reigned again in 1471 to 1483. The Wars of the Roses led to the thrones shifting between Edward and Henry, and Edward had inherited his Yorkist claim to the throne from his father Richard the Duke of York. Edward did defeat the Lancastrians heavily 
at the Battle of Toton, which was referred to as the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil, with up to 20,000 people being killed. He secretly married Elizabeth Woodville, the widow of a Lancastrian knight, which upset his key ally, the Earl of Warwick, also known as the Kingmaker. Edward did face rebellion during his time on the throne, and this in particular came from Warwick, who later turned against him, and his own brother George Plantagenet, the Duke of Clarence. George eventually was executed for treason, being drowned in a barrel of Malmsey wine. Edward's court was stated to have been one of the most splendid in the whole of Christendom, and he spent large sums of money on symbols, showing his wealth as the King of England. Much of his reign was well documented by historians, but his death still remains much of a mystery today. The King died around the 9th of April 1483, at the Palace of Westminster, and it's considered that his death was unexpected, and it took many by surprise. Edward IV was ill around the end of March, but despite having access to the best doctors and care, he did succumb to whatever it was that ended his life. His death was reported and minuted on the 9th of April and it was said, Lord Audley and Lord Barclay, now early this morning by the assent of the King's Council, sent unto the Mayor for to show and give knowledge that the King is passed out of his present life this last night. Before the sudden death of Edward IV, it was also been written that Edward was not suffering with ill health, but it was noted that the King had a strong appetite. It was said by an advisor, he was wont to show himself to those who wished to watch him, and he seized any opportunity that the occasion offered of revealing his fine stature more protractedly and more evidently to onlookers. However, in food and drink, he was most immoderate. It was his habit, so I have learned, to take an emetic for the delight of gorging his stomach. Once more for this reason, he had grown fat in the loins, but he was a tall man and very fat, though not to the point of deformity. Different sources do give different accounts of Edward, as another said how, he was a visage lovely, of body mighty, strong and clean made, and he was of youth, greatly given by fleshly wantonness, from which health of the body, in great prosperity and fortune, without a special grace hardly refraineth. So with these we can establish that the king, despite being slightly overweight around the time he died, was not suffering with an ailment for too long. Different historians have debated Edward's true cause of death, and some believe that he was rumoured to be poisoned, but others also say that it was caused by a chill or a short illness, or even that the king died of sadness. It was also believed that Edward's death was brought on by the lifestyle he was living, a rather debaucherous one. There have been allegations that he was poisoned, and one historian believed he was poisoned with arsenic or some heavy metal. But from what we know about Edward's death, is that he took to his bed around Easter Sunday on the 20th of March 1483, and that within 10 days he was dead. However, from what we know about Edward's death, is that he took to his bed around Easter Sunday 1483, and that within 10 days he was dead. His passing was said to have taken the royal court by surprise, and after he died, his body was left naked for viewing, and this showed there was no violent end to King Edward IV, with no trauma or injury to his body. There were also no noted signs of disease, for example mumps, smallpox, measles and even the bubonic plague, which would have left some signs on his body. Also, this ruled out other afflictions that were caused by bleeding under the skin, so he was not killed by leukaemia or haemophilia. As the king also was noted to have been in good standing, it's unlikely that he died from a disease such as cancer that led to him wasting away or undiagnosed diabetes. Also, it's interesting that a stroke or heart attack did not kill Edward, as the timescale of his illness denotes that there was not a sudden event that killed the king, neither was there a long drawn out process and suffering that went on for months. Polydor Virgil states how Edward fell sick of an unknown disease, and another states how he died from a mix of sadness and a cold he caught whilst out fishing. An English chronicler wrote, however it was the melancholy and anger that he took with the French king, or were it by any other means, he suddenly fell sick, and was with a grievous malady taken, yes so previously taken, that his vital spirits began to fail and wax feeble. But none of this points towards a certain cause of death, and that is what the issue is, around King Edward IV's death. So much of his story in the Wars of the Roses is recorded, but his final days were not, which further points to his death being a surprise. It's believed that as the king's health was beginning to fail, that he became subject to a number of different potions and ailments that were used by his doctors. 
This included emetics, which made him go to the toilet and also vomit, which then furthermore allowed Edward to feel empty in his stomach, and then it's believed he ate more and consumed more because of this. He would consume a large amount of food at royal banquets, and then throw up, and then go back to eat again, all of which was very dangerous. He was known for this before he fell fatally ill, but his cause of death remains a mystery. As mentioned, poison was believed to have been a possible cause, but this is most likely a theory that arose because of no obvious cause of death and at the time, this was attributed to deaths, especially of high-profile members of society, who had no signs before their shocking death. It's also been suggested that Edward died from malaria or pneumonia, but these diseases and symptoms of them have been around for centuries, and although treatments were not great, they could have easily been described. We have accounts of other royals and kings who passed away of illnesses decades and centuries before Edward, but this leads us to the contemporary account, from Edward's time, that his listed cause of death was apoplexy, which was brought on by excess and consuming food and drink to a huge amount. It was referred to as a sudden death that started with a lack of consciousness, in which the victim died after losing consciousness. It's what today would be classified as a stroke, or the rupturing of an internal organ. It's believed that Edward's lifestyle mixed with apoplexy could have been what killed him. It's clear that his health had been damaged by years of his debaucherous lifestyle, eating and drinking to excess, and as he gained a large amount of weight, it's believed this would have led to his downfall. Edward IV died at the age of 40, which was modest for a person living in the 15th century, but for a king it was still rather young. Following his death, his funeral cortege left passing Westminster Abbey, Sion Abbey and it came to rest at Windsor Castle on the 19th of April. The chapel of St George here commissioned to be built had not yet been finished but the choir aisles had been roofed with timber and the stalls were in place. Edward was brought to St George's chapel to be buried and the service was held and he was buried in a tomb in the north choir aisle and it was an elaborate burial complete with his jewelled sword and cap and his armour. These stayed until they were taken during the English Civil War. His tomb has been open since, as on the 13th of March 1789, renovations were taking place at the chapel, and it was accidentally opened. A chamber contained the lead coffin of Edward IV, where his remains along with his queen, Elizabeth Woodville, were inside. It was noted that Edward's remains showed him to be around 6 feet 3 inches tall, which was huge for a 15th century man, and this made him one of history's tallest monarchs. So with regards to what killed Edward IV, we are none the wiser. There are many different proposals put forward, but what it was that led him to live his last 10 days bedbound, and also in a significant degree of discomfort and pain, remains a mystery. Some historians even debate the date of his death, saying he died sooner, but he did die from an unknown illness. It's not believed that he was murdered by poisoning, but more that his debaucherous lifestyle of overeating and drinking, followed by the purging medication he was given, could have caused a significant rupture or injury to his internal organs that caused his death. Edward IV is remembered for being one of the key players of the Wars of the Roses, and certainly one of the winners as he managed to instill a period of dominance for the House of York. This would only be ended when Henry Tudor defeated Richard III on the battlefield and began one of history's most infamous eras, the Tudor period. Richard III was crowned king on the 6th of July 1483 at Westminster Abbey, but within two years he would be killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field in Leicestershire. The Wars of the Roses had gripped England for decades before Richard became king. He was sitting following the disappearance and denouncement of the Prince in the Tower at the top of the House of York, which surprised many as he was a brother to the former king Edward IV. Rumours emerged, however, that Richard was responsible for the murder of the true king, the boy Edward V, and through this a rebellion emerged, spearheaded by Henry Tudor. He would later become Henry VII, but despite the rebellion initially not being successful, Henry would try again two years later, and together the two met at Bosworth Field. Richard III's defeat at the Battle of Bosworth at the time was shocking. Specifically, who killed the king remains a mystery, but after the incredible discovery of Richard's remains under a car park in Leicester, the final moments of the king's life can be pieced together and told. On the 22nd of August 1485, Richard met Henry Tudor at Bosworth and rode into battle on his white courser horse. He had with him 
a strong army of around 8,000 soldiers, and the king's army outnumbered Henry's, but the key to the battle was sitting on another hill. Lord Stanley had a private army of 6,000 men, and he was a pivotal player in the battle, as his support meant everything to the two men. Richard III was deployed on Ambien Hill, and Henry on an adjacent hilltop. The battle swayed from side to side until Lord Stanley got involved and ordered his private army to support Henry Tudor, which surprised Richard and his forces. During the final part of the battle, it was said that Richard had Henry Tudor isolated, and that the Royalist army were fighting in the thickest, and the King's men were pressing for victory. Richard was worried about Lord Stanley's betrayal, and he had heard that Henry was situated a large distance from his soldiers, behind them, and was protected by a group of bodyguards. Richard, who was known for being a competent military leader, was confident he could strike the man he deemed to be trying to usurp him, and he led a small detachment of heavy cavalry and charged towards Henry Tudor and his surrounding force. In this attempt to end the battle, Richard was rather successful, and he smashed his way through Henry's guards and killed his standard bearer. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting then took place between the King's small group of charges and Henry's bodyguards, and Lord Stanley overlooking the battlefield noticed his stepson Henry was in trouble, and he commanded his soldiers to Richard III's position. It was noted how Richard fought bravely and valiantly, and allegedly even came within a sword's length of Henry Tudor, however this is where things drastically changed. Richard found himself very overwhelmed by Stanley's mercenaries, who charged towards him attacking his small force. It is disputed what happened next to Richard, but many agree that the king found himself in very marshy ground, and he and his horse became bogged down in the terrain, and the king was unhorsed. A Burgundian chronicler wrote how Richard's horse leapt into a marsh, and it could not get itself out from it. Shortly after Richard was unhorsed, his final moments came. Famously, Shakespeare writes how he cried out, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. It was stated how, the death blow was struck by a Welshman with a halberd, whilst Richard's horse was stuck, and it was said that the blow was so violent that the king's helmet was driven into his skull. The man who killed Richard has been suggested to have been Rhys Ap Thomas, a leading Welsh Lancastrian, who shaved part of the king's head with the blow which he struck him. Henry VII's official historian stated how Richard died alone fighting bravely in the thickest press of his enemies, and another account says how he fell in the field, struck by many mortal wounds, with another account suggesting that they beat his head until the brain came out with blood, they never left him until he was dead. The true brutality of the final moments of King Richard III were confirmed when his body and remains were discovered in 2013, following identification. The wounds on the body suggested that Richard's death was in fact very bloody, with 11 wounds being visible on the remains, and 8 of these were to the skull. These had been sustained during battle, which leads us to believe that Richard lost his helmet during the Battle of Bosworth. These wounds were sustained through a frenzied attack by more than one person, piling on the king as he came under pressure on the muddy battlefield. There was a narrow V-shaped cut found along the bottom right side of the lower jaw, suggesting that his face was cut by a dagger or knife or a small blade. There was another cut on his lower jaw, which could have been done by a blade which was thrust up inside of his helmet to slice the strap off, and to take off the king's protection to his head. His body was relatively well protected when he died, and so were no visible signs of injury to his torso, meaning that the chances are the king had significant and effective amounts of plate armour on, and when he died he was wearing this. There were also three glancing blows caused by a sharp blade such as a poleaxe or a sword, on the scalp that shaved the bone. Two wounds were found on the left side above the ear, and one on the top, but these wounds would not have been immediately fatal. They were all caused by the same weapon as well. On top of the skull was a small piercing hole, which was caused by a weapon delivered to the king from above, and this could have been dealt by the spike of a poleaxe or a rondel dagger. The aim of this was to drive a hole into the king's skull, inflicting damage to his brain. At the base of Richard's skull, there were two significant wounds, found which caused damage to the top of the vertebrae, and this was caused by a blade that entered the king's head, and sliced through his brain, and it was done so hard, 
as it struck the other side of the skull. These massive wounds were likely to have been fatal and were inflicted by weapons such as a halberd, sword or a bill. This blow would have been savage and was done with such brutality that it passed through the king's brain and it was this wound that likely killed Richard. This wound would have been enough on its own to have killed the king. There were other wounds found to his body, for example one was delivered as a blow from behind with a dagger which damaged his tenth rib and another scraped the pelvis and was delivered into the king's right buttocks which could have also been fatal, but it's believed this was done after death to shame the king as his armour would have protected this area during battle. Richard's remains were able to tell the world the definitive story as to what happened to the king in his final moments. As Richard was unhorsed with his horse being stuck in the mud, he was forced to dismount and at some point he lost or removed his helmet, leaving him very vulnerable. He was surrounded by a number of skilled soldiers with medieval weapons and despite being protected by his own men, when Lord Stanley's men went for the king, Richard's men were quickly overwhelmed. He was attacked by a number of soldiers who thrust their swords and daggers towards him, but a crushing blow from a halberd or a bill stopped the king in his tracks. Richard stood no chance against all of the men intent on killing him, and with the strike from the halberd, the king was killed and the reign of the Tudor dynasty began shortly after. Richard III's face was not mutilated after death to ensure that the population knew that the king was killed. His armour and clothes were taken off and his naked body was carried to nearby Leicester on a horse, being displayed in public and exhibited with everyone to see that the king had been slain. It was left on display for two days and was then interred in a plain coffin and tomb inside the low key church of the Greyfriars. His burial and body remained lost until 2013 when it was discovered and DNA testing put the remains beyond any doubt that they did in fact belong to King Richard III. With the death of Richard III, one of the most famous royal families in English history came onto the throne, the Tudors. The Tudors were known for their brutality, but Richard III was a king who was also cut from the same cloth. He would do anything to become king, but it's believed that during the Battle of Bosworth Field, he fought bravely and valiantly, something that Henry VII's own historian confirmed and Henry wanted to preserve this. His death was incredibly brutal and the final moments of Richard III show how tough and bloodthirsty the final moments of the Wars of the Roses really were. Henry VII was declared king by the right of conquest and he married Elizabeth of York with the hope of uniting the warring Yorkist and Lancastrian factions of the Plantagenet dynastic disputes. He was considered successful in this and he took steps even after the Battle of Bosworth to ensure that rebellions did not become significant. He did face a number of them initially, including one which the pretender Lambert Simnel claimed to have been Edward of Warwick. His rebellion was put down and Henry in a show of clemency allowed Simnel to work inside the royal kitchens after, placing him in charge of roasting meat on a spit. Perking Warbeck's rebellion came in 1490 when he claimed to have been Richard of Shrewsbury, the younger prince in the tower, but Henry VII put this rebellion down also and had Warbeck executed. Through a number of executions including that of William Stanley's, the Chamberlain of the Household, Henry showed the country he was not willing to be messed with. He was a king ultimately that had little experience in running lands and overseeing them, but during his reign he became known for being a wealthy king who was prudent and made the monarchy richer. He kept a close eye over the country's wealth and did impose a number of taxes. The increase in tax and the ruthlessness in which it was collected did affect his popularity inside of England. In terms of his foreign policy, he sought to maintain peace following the Wars of the Roses in England and to make money. He signed a treaty with France that brought wealth to England and importantly stated that France would not support any more pretenders claiming to take the throne. Henry did invade Brittany in November 1492 as he wished to keep it from the French as they had recently signed an agreement and alliance with Spain that he deemed to be dangerous. He built up his navy for this and he realised the importance and danger of the Spanish Kingdom. He also formed an alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope. He was shrewd along with his advisers around trade 
and through major industries such as wool and cloth, England became a rather prosperous nation. English cloth during his reign began to become traded in different places. To secure his power further, he used justices of the peace on a big scale, and their job was to ensure that the country's laws were being adhered to. The court of the Star Chamber was also used to allow Henry to deal with disputes and issues quickly, and he dealt with threats to his own power swiftly through this. Justices of the peace were seen as key law enforcers for Henry VII, and despite being unpaid, they were successful and efficient. So overall, during his reign, Henry VII did have a significant degree of positive things to ensure that the monarchy was much more stable than it was during the Wars of the Roses. However, in 1502, tragedy struck the royal family. Henry VII and Elizabeth had a child named Arthur, who was a great hope for the Tudor dynasty. He was their eldest son and was the heir apparent to the throne, and had married Catherine of Aragon, forming an alliance between England and the emerging and feared Spanish. However, shortly after the marriage, Arthur was taken ill, and at Ludlow Castle he died from a viral illness known as a sweating sickness. This devastated the king, and he was regarded as a reserved man who rarely showed any emotion in public. However, he was overcome by immense grief and upset. He was known to have been sobbing uncontrollably at court, and the death of Arthur shattered him greatly. But a year later, further upset for the king came, as his queen Elizabeth of York passed away, and he shut himself away following this for a number of days and refused to speak to anyone. Henry was completely devastated by the loss of Elizabeth, and her death caused him great heartbreak. Following her death, he considered remarrying, but nothing came to anything. He considered marriage to renew alliances with Spain, but through the negotiations for Catherine of Aragon to marry his other son Henry, the future Henry VIII, this was seen as sufficient. He did take an interest in Johanna of Naples, but this never came to anything. After Elizabeth's death, Henry himself became very ill and nearly died from an unknown illness, but he did recover. He remained ill for a number of years, and in his final years it was noted how his sickness increased daily more and more. Between February and March 1508, Henry suffered from gout, and it was said he was in the very last stages of consumption in July 1508. A month later it was reported that Henry was very ill, an extremist, and that he was very ill, with little hope of recovery. By the end of March 1509, Henry must have known that his death was coming soon, and he made his last will and testament. It's believed that the decline in his health was made quicker by the death of Elizabeth and Arthur, and his mood became very depressed after these. Other veterans of his campaign against Richard III had passed away, and he made arrangements for a seamless transition of power to his son, Prince Henry. Accounts of Henry VII's death came mostly from Bishop John Fisher, who had a sermon on the 10th of May 1509, shortly after the event. He said how two nights before the king's death, he became so weak that he could not hear mass at the altar, and had struggled for some time to eat and drink. However, he was keen to do his religious duty, and he summoned his confessor to his bedside to hear the sacrament. Mass at his bedside was heard, and it was said to have been a very moving spectacle. It was said that those who witnessed Henry receiving the sacrament were moved with a marvellous compassion and flow of tears, that sometimes they wept and sobbed by the space of three quarters of an hour. An image of the proceedings shortly before the king's death shows him attended on by a number of his closest courtiers and most intimate members of his household. Shortly after hearing the religious blessing, Henry managed to cling on to life for another 48 hours. On the day of his death, he heard Mass again, and this time held the crucifix a number of times, with great reverence, embracing it tenderly and kissing it. He was in a significant amount of pain, and was suffering and was scared, and he in his final moments appealed to Jesus to deliver his soul and to protect him. It was said he claimed, O my blessed Jesus, O my Lord, deliver my soul from the misery of this world, Deliver my soul from these deadly pains. Deliver my soul from this corruptible body. In his final moments, the king's son, Prince Henry, who was just 17 at the time, 
was summoned to his father's bedside for his final instructions, and the king said, Fatherly and godly exhortations committed unto him the laborious governance of this realm of England. The king passed away, surrounded by his closest advisers, with William Fitzwilliam, the gentleman usher of Henry's office, being responsible for closing the king's eyes after death. Inside of his bedchamber in Richmond Palace, on the 21st of April 1509, Henry VII died from what it's believed to have been tuberculosis at the age of 52. He was buried in the chapel he commissioned to be built, Henry VII's Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey, and was laid to rest alongside his wife, Elizabeth of York. It was clear in his final days, Henry VII knew what was coming. He ultimately knew what he was facing, and he decided to end his days in pious prayer and repentance for any sins he had committed. Inside of Richmond Palace, he was not alone, being attended on by his closest advisers and friends. It was his son who would take the throne and become Henry VIII, and his reign in particular is known for brutality and turmoil. Henry VII sought to bring an end to the turbulent nature of the time, but Henry VIII, his successor, ripped up all of the work his father had done and changed the face of English history forever, dividing his nation further by religion. In fact, Henry VIII drove as big a wedge through the population by his religious reforms as the War of the Roses ever did. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.